In this video, I'm going to cover the equilibrium constant. So for the general reaction, A plus B makes C plus D, remember we can also specify um, a, co a stoichiometric coefficient. So little a is like the stoichiometric coefficient and big A is the reactant. Little b is the coefficient of this and big B is the reactant and so on and so on. So in this reaction, I can create what's called an equilibrium constant, which is a mathematical expression that shows the uh, ratio of the product concentration to the reactant concentration for a reaction that is at equilibrium. So here's the mathematical expression for the equilibrium constant. We, the symbol is K, capital K. And so if this is what my, my uh, chemical reaction looks like, then it's the concentration of C, this product, concentration of products divided by concentration of reactants. So products goes on top, maybe a little bit counterintuitively. So the concentration of C raised to its stoichiometric coefficient. And the con times the concentration of D raised to its coefficient, times the concentration of A raised to its coefficient, times the concentration of B raised to its coefficient. So now this is in direct contrast to what we just said in the last chapter, where when I'm looking at the stoichiometric coefficient at the beginning of um, a chemical reaction, and I'm trying to create what's called the rate law, and I'm looking at kinetic information, I cannot use little a and plug it in as the power here for uh, the rate law to, as the order of the reactant. Remember, I have to actually look at experimental data and I have to calculate the order of reactant based on how the rate changes um, as I change the concentrations. So that has to be determined experimentally. It can't be determined um, by just looking at a, at a reaction. But when I'm talking about equilibrium and I'm trying to calculate the equilibrium constant expression here K, then that's exactly what we do. What we weren't supposed to do last chapter, we are supposed to do this chapter. We just take the coefficient from our reaction and I plug it in. Little a becomes the order. It, it's not called the order anymore. It's just the, it, I'm just raising it to that stoichiometric coefficient, but it becomes the exponent of a. And little b becomes the exponent of b in the equilibrium expression, uh, equilibrium constant expression. So this will make more sense when we actually look at some actual uh, reactions and not just generic A's and B's. So here is a, a real reaction. Two of this reactant is in equilibrium with four of this product plus one of this product. So this would be like little A times big A. And I only have one reactant, so there's no B. And that makes little C times big C. Big C is this product. Um, plus little d, which in this case would be 1, because there's nothing there, times big D, capital D, which is um, the concentration of oxygen. So capital A is this reactant, capital B and capital C, and then lowercase a, lowercase c, and lowercase d would be the numbers that are associated with those reactants or products. So the equilibrium constant expression, so remember the equilibrium constant expression is generically the concentration of C raised to its coefficient times the concentration of D raised to its coefficient divided by the concentration of A raised to its coefficient times the concentration of B raised to its coefficient. So for this equation here, little a, big, big A, capital A, is N2O5. So that's my product, or excuse me, my reactant down here. And that's raised to its coefficient, which in this case is 2. And my products, C and D, in the numerator, here's C and D, and they're raised to their coefficients. So the coefficient of C is 4, so NO2 is raised to the fourth power, and the coefficient of O2 would be 1 if there were anything written here. And so it's raised to the first power, to the, um, the exponent is 1 for oxygen. So this is how we create an equilibrium constant expression. It's pretty easy. You just um, look at any reaction that you're given, and if there are three products, then you would just put three products on the top. If there are four products, you put all four products on the top. 
If there's one reactant, you put one down here. If there's two reactants, you put both of them down here. So we just look at a reaction, determine the reactants and the products, and look at the coefficient in front of each of those reactants and products, and, and that becomes the exponent. So here are some properties, some relationships uh, between K and their chemical equations, the equilibrium constant and the chemical equation. So um, if I can calculate an equilibrium constant with this generic expression, and this is the form of my equilibrium expression like we were just talking about, C times D divided by A times B, well then the backwards reaction where C and D are now the reactants, and A and B are now the products. I just flipped this one around, right? If I flip that around, then the equilibrium constant for the reverse reaction is just the reverse of this one, right? Because I always do products over reactants. So for this reaction, I do products, C and D, over reactants, A and B. And for the reverse reaction, I do products, A and B, over reactants, C and D. So I just flip them. So the equilibrium constant for the backwards reaction is equal to 1 divided by the equilibrium constant for the forward reaction, and vice versa. They're just the inverse of each other. OK, another mathematical property of equilibrium constants is that um, if I have a reaction like this, right? So I still have products C divided by reactants, A plus B. Um, but if I have another reaction where now I just take that same reaction and I double all the coefficients, 2A plus 2B makes 2C, same reaction, just doubling the coefficients, then what I would do, remember, is now I would, um, that those coefficients, those doubled coefficients, become the exponents in my equilibrium expression. So if I had A and B and C in the original reaction and then I double them, then my exponents become 2A, and 2b and 2c. So um, what that means is that in terms of the equilibrium constants, capital K, if I have a reaction um, and then I have another reaction, the only difference is that the stoichiometric coefficients are some factor increased. Maybe they're doubled or tripled or I can figure out what n is. I just took that original reaction and increased it by some factor. Then the equilibrium constants change accordingly. They, I take the, equal, the old equilibrium constant and raise it to the power of n, and n is just whatever factor I increased that reaction by. Did I double it? Then n is 2. Did I triple it? Then n is 3, and so on. OK, another thing we can do. If I have two reactions that I'm going to add together, or rather I multiply them together, remember the way that we do this um, is uh, we've looked at this in terms of thermodynamics. When we're so when we're adding reactions together, we can um, uh, cancel out any reactants and products that are the same. So if I have a, a product here that's um, the same as a reactant in the next reaction, remember then reactants and products on the opposite sides of the equation can cancel out. So if I add reaction A goes to B, with the reaction B goes to C, then what I the outcome is A goes to C, right? That would be this reaction. After I add them together, I would get this. So what happens to their equilibrium constants? Well, the equilibrium constant for this first reaction is products over reactants, B over A. The equilibrium constant for the second reaction is products over reactants, C over B. Um, and the equilibrium constant for the third reaction is products over reactants, C over A. So what I've done is what, if I add these two equilibrium constants together, B over A and C over B, then mathematically you can see that indeed B on the top and B on the bottom are going to cancel because B over B equals 1. So then my new equilibrium constant is just C over A, just as was implied when I was looking at the reactions up here. So in order, if I, get, if I have two equilibrium, if I have two reactions that I'm trying to add together, and the question says, what's the equilibrium constant of this new reaction, A to C, if I know the equilibrium constants of reactions 1 and 2? Then I would just take those equilibrium constants and multiply them together. K1 times K2 equals 
K1 times K2 equals K3. All right, just like we see down here. Um, so when we're talking about solutions, then we're talking about um, a mixture, a mixture that has a solvent and a solute. And so when we're talking about um, solutions, we always have to talk about the concentration, which is how much solute is there and how much solvent is there. Because generally when we're talking about a chemical reaction, it's only the solute that is reacting. The solvent generally does not participate in a chemical reaction. It's only there to kind of break up the solute particles and to get them into contact with other reactants. So when I'm talking about uh, a solution, I need to talk about the concentration because that's what's going to affect the rate. How much reactant is there? Uh, but when I'm talking about gases, uh, we don't necessarily have a concentration because gases are pure. So in a, a gas not being a mixture, I can't talk about its concentration. I can't talk about how much solute and how much solvent there is. But I can still calculate a con an equilibrium constant if I'm talking about a gas that o or a, a reaction that only occurs in the gas phase. So if A and B are gases and C and D are gases, then this equation doesn't really make sense because the there is no concentration for something that's pure. Remember, concentration is only um, a term that we use when we're talking about mixtures. So, um, so instead, when we're looking at a, a chemical reaction that is dealing with gases, we can multiply the, the pressure of those gases and exchange that for the concentration. So when I'm talking about solutions, I use their concentrations. But when I'm talking about pure gases, I can use their pressure or their partial pressure. Um, and really, the idea here is when I talk about concentration, I need to know um, the concentration because that tells me how many solute particles there are. And I need to know how many solute particles there are because that affects the rate, how fast they're going to run into each other, how spread out are they. Well, the pressure kind of gives me the same idea. The pressure tells me how many reactant particles and product particles are there um, and how spread out are they. So we can think about the pressure of a gas as being similar to the concentration of a solute. It tells us how many particles there are and how likely they are to run into each other and we need to know that so that we can figure out what the equilibrium position is going to be. So Kp, which is the equilibrium expression um, that uses gases with pressure and oops and kc which is the equilibrium expression that uses concentration so k with concentration k with pressure k with concentration and k with pressure these are related to each other so that if i calculate kp i can convert it into kc and vice versa and here is the way in which they are related kp equals the equilibrium constant with regards to concentration times RT raised to delta N. R is the, uh, the gas constant, T is the temperature, and delta N is the difference between the number of moles of reactant and the number of moles of product. Um, the number of moles of reactant and moles of product of gases. So we'll do an example here in just a minute, and we'll use uh, this equation, and we'll try to calculate delta N, and we'll try to calculate Kp as a function of Kc. So the point is that when I can, uh, if I calculate Kp, I can convert it into Kc and vice versa. And the way that they're related is by how many moles of gas have changed in the, uh, the reactant versus the product such that if, there, if the moles of gas in the reactant, let's say there's two moles of gas in the reactant, and there's two moles of gas in the product, then delta N would equal zero, two minus two, and in that case, Kp and Kc are the same. So the only difference between an equilibrium constant calculated with pressure and an equilibrium constant calculated with concentration, they're really the same thing, unless I change the moles of gas.
And if I go from example, two moles of gas to three moles of gas in a reaction, then Kp and Kc are not equal. These are not equal if this is the case because two and three are not the same. But if I went from 2A gas to 2B gas and I had two moles of gas in, as reactant and two moles of gas as product, then delta N would equal zero and Kp and Kc would be the same. Okay, so um, we just talked about what we do with solutions. And remember, a solution A, when we look at a, a reaction, its um, phase is indicated with an AQ. And we talked about what happens when we have gases. B as a gas. But what happens with solids? and liquids. So <clears throat> when a component of a reaction is a solution, then we can tell when we look at the reaction because it says AQ. If it's AQ, then I need to know its concentration, and I'll cal I can calculate Kc using the concentration of a solution. If a reactant is a gas, it doesn't have a concentration, but it has a pressure. So if a reactant is a gas indicated with a G, then I need to know its pressure so I can calculate Kp. So Kc, Kp. But what about if a reactant or product is a solid? And what about if a reactant or product is a liquid? A solid doesn't have a concentration because it's pure, just like a gas. Um, and a liquid doesn't have a concentration because it's pure. Solids, gases, and liquids are pure substances. They don't have a concentration. In the, in, a, uh, in the case of a gas, I can talk about its pressure uh, because the number of particles within that space is changing. So I can kind of imagine that like the volume that the gas is occupying, that's kind of like the solvent. And the gas particles themselves, that's kind of like the solute. And as the reaction goes forward and the gas, the particles, uh, gas particles react and they turn into something else, then the number of particles within that volume has changed, it's decreased. So it's kind of like the concentration of the gas decreased because the solvent didn't change, the volume in which the, the gas is reacting is the same, but the number of solute particles changed because A turned into B. So um, pressure is another way of talking about kind of like the concentration of a gas. But solids and liquids don't have concentrations either, and they also don't have pressure. I can't talk about the pressure of a solid, and I can't talk about the pressure of a liquid. So um, in, in a sense, the concentration of a, a solution changes as a reaction occurs. The concentration of a gas kind of, even though it's a pure thing, the pressure of the gas changes, which is kind of a way of talking about its concentration, how many particles there are inside some volume. So these kind of change as a reaction occurs, as a reaction moves forward. But a solid and a liquid, the concentrations of pure solids and pure liquids do not change during the course of a reaction. So if I have some amount of solid, and we might talk about the concentration of a solid is how much stuff there is in a volume, right? We, we specify some volume, and we talk about how much there is within that volume. So I've got a pile of uh, solid here. Here's my pile of solid stuff in a reaction, and it's in my beaker, so it's reacting. My pile of solid stuff, if I take a window and I just examine this little tiny bit of my solid stuff right here over time and I kind of have a magnifying glass and I make it bigger and I look at this little window right here so I can see what's happening. The amount of stuff that's in this window, how much there is per unit, is not changing over the course of the reaction because the amount of stuff there, I'm kind of looking at this, the amount of stuff there is per unit volume in a solid all these particles are packed together as tightly as possible, right? The crystal structure of the solid, the, the spheres get together as close as they can. And as the reaction occurs, some of these spheres on the outside get used up, but all the spheres on the inside, I have just as many of them per unit volume as I had to begin with. So 
what what's the quality that I talk about when I'm talking about the number of things I have per unit volume in a solid it's called density the number of solute particles I have per unit volume in a solution we call that concentration the number of gas particles I have in a given volume we call that pressure the number of solid particles I have in a given volume, I call that density, the density of the solid, or the, or the density of the liquid. So either way, the density of the solid or the density of the liquid, we can consider those to be the concentration of those substances, and the density of them doesn't change. The, so the concentration of a pure solid, the amount of particles I have per given volume, is always the same in a solid. And in a liquid, it's always the same. So because their concentration doesn't change, solids and liquids, little s and little l in a chemical reaction, they're not included in an equilibrium expression. So let's look at this expression down here. I have uh, a gas plus a liquid makes a solution plus a solution. Well, the gas, I can calculate its concentration um, talking about uh, the vol um, in terms of its pressure, right? So how many particles there are per given volume. And with the solutions, I can talk about their concentration. But the liquid, its concentration is pure, is, uh, does, is constant, it never changes. So I will put products over reactants. So here's my products, this times this, divided by reactants. CO2 times H2O, but H2O, since it's a pure liquid, I don't put it into the equilibrium expression. CO2 is a gas, so it can go in the equilibrium expression, but H2O is a liquid, so it does not go in the equilibrium expression. So here is an example. Here's a reaction. Two CO gas these two uh, carbon monoxide particles they can run into each other and when they run into each other this one and this this one will give an oxygen atom to this so I'll make a CO2 but one of the carbons deposits and becomes solid carbon just becomes part of this pile so if I have this much solid carbon then as the two CO's run into each other then they're gonna bump into each other and the carbons gonna fall and the CO2 gas is uh, going to be emitted. And the amount of stuff that I have here doesn't affect the rate of the reaction. Because it doesn't, it's certainly the amount of carbon doesn't affect the forward rate. Because the forward rate is only affected by how many CO particles I have. I need two CO particles to bump into each other. So when they bump into each other, then I have this. And then you might say, well, it does matter how much C I have because if CO2 has to bump into C, then if there's more C, then CO2 can bump into C faster. But the C is always going to uh, have the same pile, right? There's always the amount of C that's available to react is always going to be the same unless we change the surface area. But the amount of C that's available to react in a solid is kind of a function of its density. So if I change the amount of C, the amount of surface area of carbon, then maybe there's more carbon atoms available for the CO2 to run into and to make two of these CO molecules. But short of changing the surface area, which would change the rate, just changing the amount of C that I have does not change the, does not change the reaction because it has the, same, the density, the amount of carbons available is always going to be the same. So here is an example of this equilibrium constant. It's kind of a strange thing when we look at it mathematically. An equilibrium constant says that it is a, is a constant, right? A constant is a number that doesn't change. So that's really weird because what numbers go into the equilibrium constant? The concentration of reactants and the concentration of products goes into an equilibrium constant. But the number K is always the same number. So look at this. I can change the initial concentration. I can. This is how much I start with, how much reactant I start with, and how much product. So if I start with 0.5 molar A and 0.5 molar B and 0 C, 
when the reaction comes to equilibrium, these will be my new concentrations. Right? I started with 0.5 and now I have 0.11, so some of my reactant was lost. And I started with zero product. Let's separate reactants and products here. I started with zero product, and now I have 0.78 product. I gained some, right? Lost some reactant, gained some product. So when I plug these equilibrium concentrations into the equilibrium expression, which is products over reactants, HI raised to the power of 2 divided by the concentration of H2 divided by the con uh, times the concentration of I2. Here's how I would make my, con my equilibrium expression. When I plug these numbers in, I get 50. So now, what if I start with the exact opposite? What if I start with a reaction where I have zero reactant and I start with 0.5 HI? So really, I'm talking about the reverse reaction. Really, this will be my reactant now, and it's going to move this way to create product, right? So if I do that, here are the equilibrium concentrations I get. They're totally different than these ones, right? I started with the same number, but here I was starting with 0.5 of each reactant and zero product. And here I'm starting with zero of each reactant and 0.5 product. My equilibrium concentrations are different, but when I plug them into the equilibrium to the same equation, the number is 50. Again, 50, 50. Look, I'll change them again. Now each of them starts with 0 0.5. 0 0.5 of A, 0 0.5 of B, and 0 0.5 of C. I get different equilibrium concentrations again, but when I plug those numbers in, it's still equal 50. I start off with totally different numbers. I get these totally different numbers. Plug them in, still get 50. Totally different numbers. Plug them in, still get 50. So the equilibrium constant is kind of mathematically magic, it seems like. It doesn't matter what initial concentrations you start with. You'll always end with a set of equilibrium concentrations that when you plug them into this expression always gives you the same number. So these concentrations are predetermined. The equilibrium concentrations are predetermined based on where you start. We can always figure out what these are because this number is always the same. It's always 50, 50, 50, 50, 50 in this case for this reaction. So we can use this to our advantage. And what that means is that if I start a reaction and I have any initial concentration, then I can calculate all of these equilibrium concentrations, even though the numbers are always different. I always can figure out what they're going to be if I know initial concentrations and I know the equilibrium constant. It tells me what these are going to be. So um, in order to apply that equilibrium constant effectively, I need to know whether my reaction is going to go forward or backwards. Right? We just looked at some of those examples on the table, and if I have uh, um, one molar A and one molar B and zero molar C, so I have all reactant and I have no product, it's pretty easy to imagine that that reaction is going to move forward. It's going to go from reactant to product. Right? If I have only this stuff and none of this stuff, there's only one way for the reaction to go. It has to go this way. And conversely, if I have only this stuff and I don't have any reactants, there's only one way for the reaction to go. It has to go this way. But what happens if I have one molar A, one molar B, one molar C, and one molar D? What if I start a reaction like that? Which way does it go? Is it going to move forward or is it going to move backwards? Well, in order to know that, I have to calculate what's called the reaction quotient, and I have to know the equilibrium constant. So. I kind of think of equilibrium constant as like a teeter-totter. So the equilibrium constant like this, maybe it's like my reactants are heavy and my products are light. And K is kind of the, the balance that tells me how what is the balance of reactant to product. It's always going to be different. But if I have two, if I have one, molar A, one molar B, one molar C, one molar D, how do I know if, my react if I have too many reactants or too many products? I have to know what K is. K will tell me, oh, well, for that reaction, I'm supposed to have like 90% reactant and 10% and product. And right now I have 50-50. If it's 1 to 1 to 1 to 1, then it's 50-50. But K tells me it's supposed to be 90-10, not 
So if it's supposed to be 90-10, and right now it's 50-50, then that means my reaction must go this way. Because if I only have 50% A and B and it's supposed to be 90, because that's what my equilibrium constant says, then I need to get 40% more. The equilibrium constant and the reaction quotient are really the same reaction, or the same equation. Because look, K, when I have K, C, it equals C times D over A times B. So Q and K are almost identical. The only difference is that when I'm looking at Q, I'm looking at initial concentration. Initial. 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 And when I'm calculating K, I'm talking about equilibrium concentrations. Equilibrium, 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 equilibrium. Now what's the difference? Remember, this table shows us the difference. If I start with any initial concentration, this is how much A and B I start, I start with before the reaction occurs at time zero, and I just throw it all into the flask and push go, and then I let it, I let it react for a while, and I come back to it the next day. By the next day, it will probably have reached equilibrium, and at equilibrium, then I have a different set of concentrations. I start with these, let it sit for a day, what does it look like after that? I start with this, let it sit for a day, what does it look like after that? So everything that I start with, those are my initial concentrations, and after I let it react for a while and it has reached equilibrium, the reaction stops changing, then those are my equilibrium concentrations. So the only difference between Q and K is do I put in the initial concentrations? Well, if I do, I'm calculating Q. If I put in the equilibrium concentrations after the reaction has stopped changing, then I'm calculating K. So they're really the same equation, it just depends on where am I in the reaction. This is at the very beginning of the reaction before it's even really started. And this is at the very end of the reaction after I've reached equilibrium. So if I plug in the numbers from Q and I compare them to K, then I can see where I'm at in the equilibrium. So if, if I plug in the numbers from Q and I get I calculate 50, and then I look at the equilibrium constant, and the equilibrium constant is 50, then Q and K are the same thing. They're both 50. That means that the, equal, the reaction is already at equilibrium. Those, re, those numbers for, that I put in for Q that I thought were initial concentrations, those are actually equilibrium concentrations, because Q equals K, they're the same number. If Q is bigger than K, then that means that uh, the, there's too many products. So remember, when we're calculating Q, products go on top, products over reactants. So if Q is bigger than K, then that means products is a bigger number than reactants. So that means that I have too many products if Q is bigger than K. So if Q is bigger than K, I have to get rid of products. So the reaction moves to the left, the reverse reaction happens, and products become reactants. If Q is smaller than K, then that means that um, products over reactants. That means that my reactants are too big or my products are too small, depending on how you want to look at it. And if my product is too small, then the reaction has to run to the right. A turns into B, so I can convert some reactant into product, because as Q, if Q is smaller than K, the only way to make Q bigger so that it equals K is to turn reactant into product. Then the product will become bigger, the number in the numerator will get bigger, and Q will get bigger until finally it equals K, and Q equals K, and I'm at equilibrium. So calculating Q by plugging in those concentrations tells me is my reaction at equilibrium or not. And I just compare Q to K, and I can figure out if it's at equilibrium or not.